Beacon, welcome to this rather strange way of communicating. What extraordinary times we're living in. Almost everything we considered normal seems to have changed, doesn't it, in just in the last week or two. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I fully processed what's going on. It just seems to have all happened just so, so quickly. I must just tell you this, on Thursday morning, I went out uh, and arrived at Sainsbury's at seven o'clock in the morning. Usually the car park would be deserted. It was absolutely rammed. I could barely find a parking place. Anyway, I went in there and the first person I bumped into was Roger Smallwood, who looked at me very lovingly and said, you shouldn't be here. You're in the wrong age group. <laughs> I realised it was a 70 plus. So I had to beat a very hasty retreat. Very embarrassing. Strange, weird times. One thing is for certain though, and that is that we as Christians are so grateful, aren't we, that we are not living our lives according to the shifting sands of circumstances or what we hear on the media, but we are basing our lives on the rock of Jesus Christ. As someone once said, the good thing about hitting rock bottom is that at least you found the rock. And I think our prayer is, as a church, that many of our unsaved friends and neighbours, colleagues, family, that this world would find that rock that we have found, Jesus Christ, that solid place, unshakable place to build your life safely. You know, the other day, I think it was a Sunday before last, Eric started the service, didn't he, with that beautiful psalm, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the seas. I didn't read it as beautifully as Eric did, but what a great psalm for times like this. As I'm speaking, there are, in all likelihood, 55,000 or more cases of coronavirus in the UK, 150 or so deaths so far. Earlier this week, SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, predicted that if we continue with our sort of more open lifestyle, the death toll would rise to a quarter of a million. And so drastic measures were introduced to try and reduce that number down to 20,000 or so, which still sounds like a prodigiously high number. The nation's been shut down, hasn't it, this week? Airlines have stopped their planes from flying, schools have closed, exams cancelled, universities have been moved online. Globally, I think there are now a quarter million or so cases of coronavirus with over 9,000 deaths rising by the hour. As we know, the economies of nations have been devastated. Shops, hotels, businesses are endangered. World stock markets have tumbled. ISAs, pension funds plummeted. And in situations like this, frankly, it's easy just to lose our faith and confidence and start to live in fear of headlines and of the unknowns. In the UK, of course, just to add to that, churches have closed down Sunday meetings as well as small group meetings. Some preachers across the world are suggesting without, I think, any scriptural foundation at all that if you're a believer, God will not allow this virus to touch you. Others are saying that this is God's judgment on sinful cities and arrogant nations. Well, how do we as Christians try and make sense of this pandemic. What I want to do in the next few minutes is just to give a general overview from the Bible. How do we make sense of what's happening globally? How can we derive comfort and peace at a time like this? How can we not just survive but actually thrive in a time of being cooped up and in relative isolation? Well, let's start with a general overview. Is this God's judgment? Well, there are plenty of scriptures to suggest that at the end times, life will get more difficult. I think we all know of Matthew 24, which tells us that you'll, you know, you'll hear of all these wars and rumours and wars, nations against nations, kingdom against kingdoms, and all this sort of uncertainty. These, it says, are the beginnings of the birth pains. Some are going on further than that are actually quoting Revelation 6, which talks about the seven seals, the fourth one being the pale horse you know, famine and death and plague, which uh, will kill a quarter of the Earth's population. Well, I don't think it's up to us to make these alarmist 
and extreme statements. We're likely to be viewed as being a bit cranky and weird by our neighbours and friends if we do. Anyway, I've got no reason to suppose that these are the days spoken of in Revelation 6, but it is probably safe to say that these are birth pangs of the end of the age. God does indeed judge by illness and disease and I think this as well is clearly borne out in scriptures. So let's just look at one or two examples. It's a quick overview in Acts 12. You'll see there verse 21 that Herod was addressing a crowd of people in his great sort of arrogance. They shouted out this is the voice of God and he didn't give glory to God and the, the, the word of God says that he was struck down, eaten by worms and died. Doesn't sound very pleasant. If you think about it, it's pretty amazing that more of our presidents and prime ministers and kings don't drop dead every day because of the general arrogance that goes on. Another example is the preach, actually, that several weeks ago we were scheduled to be preaching on Romans 8, one, sorry, sorry, Romans 118, on the our next preach in the Roman series, March 29th. So this is our next scripture, if you like, we're lined up to preach about. What amazing providential circumstances that actually God speaking to us beacon this was going to be our very next scripture Romans 1 18 listen the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness for since the creation of the world God his invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen people are without excuse so in verse 27 of that chapter, you'll actually find specific examples of sickness being a judgment on sin. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. And incidentally, you know, just in case we as Christians are feeling a bit insulated from all of this, it's not just unbelievers who experience sickness and even death as an outworking of God's discipline or judgment. The believers in Corinth, if you remember, in 1 Corinthians 11, actually experienced sickness and even death because they were not respecting the communion. And because in their case it wasn't for condemnation, because Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That was simply for God purifying the church, taking people to heaven to be with himself rather than allowing them to go on in that trajectory of sin. So God will, if you like, discipline you to death you know, even as a Christian believer, but he'll bring you to heaven. You're saved. Great believer in once saved, always saved if you've been properly saved to begin with. So, God can use illness to judge those who reject him and his ways, whether Christians or not. And it's not wrong to ask ourselves, is this COVID-19 actually a kind of global shot across the bows by God, or a defibrillating shock, if you like, of divine grace calling people and the nations everywhere to repent and realign themselves by God's grace with God's ways and his word and his purposes. Listen now to the words of Jesus in Luke 13 1 to 5. In this passage Pilate had slaughtered worshippers in the temple and the tower of Siloam had collapsed and killed 18 bystanders. The crowds wanted to know from Jesus what he thought of this. Had those 18 been particularly sinful and been judged? Well, Jesus' answer to them was actually quite disconcerting. This is what he said, no, and unless you repent, you too will perish. Well, let's ask ourselves, is this the message of Jesus to our world now through this COVID virus? A message to every single human being, Christian or non-Christian, is everyone receiving a powerful message from God saying this is a good time now, this is a time to repent and seek God's mercy to bring our lives into alignment with his word. C.S. Lewis famously wrote these words, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, but shouts to us in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Well, after all that, let's go on to some good news. When the world shakes, God is our unshakable refuge. We love that children's song, don't we? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Now, the good news is that's not just a song, it's a scripture. Proverbs 18.10. 
we should be building ourselves up with your scriptures. You know, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you're feeling a bit sort of wobbly and 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 panicky at the moment, just get into some of these lovely scriptures. You know, actually Psalm 91, why don't you learn that by heart? Psalm 31, the one we've just quoted, Proverbs 18, 10, Psalm 46. This one, Isaiah 30, 15, it holds that beautiful promise in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Recently, I've been quoting, a lot of people have been quoting, haven't we? Hebrews 12, 26, once more, he has said, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The word once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. I don't know about you, but it's obvious, isn't it, that this modern world has become so self-sufficient that the, we've been squeezing God out of our lives and out of our timetables. He is superfluous to our needs. It's, this has been an extraordinary reminder that we are not self-sufficient. We are fragile beyond belief and so, so in need of a saviour. What we've been seeing over the last few weeks is an object lesson, really, of Psalm 2. I mean, listen to this psalm. It's absolutely spot on for the moment. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth, pr princes, presidents, prime ministers rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Zion is a picture of the church and the king there is clearly Jesus. And that psalm ends, therefore, be wise. Kiss the son. Kiss is the Hebrew word for worship or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. It's a great warning psalm, but actually I love the word laughs. The Lord scoffs at the nations, just the Lord clicks his fingers. And what happens? International travel shuts down. Governments and nations go into lockdown. Stock markets tumble. Now is the time to repent. Our message to our family, friends, neighbours and colleagues at this time must be Turn back to God. Plead for his mercy and healing for our world and our nation. We're going to have a lot of prayer meetings coming up and fasting. We've got to be pleading to God at this time to pour out his Holy Spirit and bring people back to himself. You know, the Bible is crystal clear. If you're listening to this and you don't know Jesus, the Bible is crystal clear. Romans 3.23 puts it like this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, think about that. God is perfect. He dwells in inapproachable light. Habakkuk 1 says that God is of holier eyes than to even look upon sin. It's just arrogant of us to think that we could come into God's presence based on our own righteousness because we've given to Red Nose Day or something is ludicrous. That is not the kind of currency that God accepts in heaven. God accepts one currency, and that is the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. We are sinful. We've lived much of our lives ignoring God, doing our own thing, even boasting, I did it my way, as if God, our creator and judge, who one day is going to call us to account. We're going to have to give an account for every idle word that we have spoken we will be judged individually in front of that 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 throne of god in reality of course god is not going to be impressed that we did it our way the reverse is true he will judge sin romans 6 23 for the wages of sin listen to this is death and then he tacks onto that sentence but this is so gracious. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So what happens here is that 2,000 years ago, 
you, your sins were judged. You were found guilty and the sentence was passed. It's a death sentence. Jesus Christ stood up and said, I will pay that death sentence for them. He paid our death sentence for us on the cross so that if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you've kind of accessed into that wonderful gift of salvation. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not easy grace. You, you must ask for this. It just doesn't come automatically. Not everyone will be saved. A price has been paid, but you have to receive that gift like any gift. It has to be received. So if you're watching this and you, you don't know Christ, if specifically you cannot remember a time, think back when you gave your life to him. If you're not certain that if you died tonight, you would be going straight to heaven. If you don't have that assurance, knowing that you know that you know that Jesus is your saviour and your Lord, then let's pray right now. So what I'm going to do is going to pray. I want you to repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things that I've done wrong in my life. Now take a few moments here just to think about the things that spring to mind, which you know have been displeasing to God, have been out of line with what your conscience has been telling you and what the word of God tells you. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. You know what? Romans 10, 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you've just prayed that prayer, then you have called on the name of the Lord. So if you've done that for the first time, would you email us at the office, office at tbcw.org, the Beacon Church, whitchurch.org. So that's the office at tbcw.org. And just let us know who you are. We'd love to give you some resources to help you grow in your faith. So let's use this time to stay in fellowship with one another through every means possible. Let's deepen our intimacy with God. Don't just use this time to go into Netflix and Amazon Prime and TV. Actually get out some sermons, get out, listen to sermons, watch them, read Christian books, read your Bible. Just really get into the Word of God and use this extra time that we have to develop and nurture your intimacy with God. Sow to the Spirit and reap that spiritual harvest. And thirdly, evangelism. Do you know what? There was a prophecy to Barnabas Church in Shrewsbury probably about 10 or 15 years ago, I don't know the details, that when, and this was during the first time they were flooded, that when they were flooded for the third time, revival would break out. Well, incredibly, they were flooded for the third time on the 27th of February, just a few weeks ago. So actually, this is a time of revival, when God can sweep through this nation by his Holy Spirit, convicting people that they need a saviour, that they're not self-sufficient, and bringing whole thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, who knows, even millions, into relationship with him through Jesus as he gathers people onto that solid, unshakable rock of Jesus Christ. Look, stay safe, wash your hands, cover your cough, love your family, save your neighbour, pray, Treasure Jesus, and we love you very much. God bless you.